Good afternoon. I guess it's afternoon. Close to it. Where's our little friends? I don't want to take up the time, so um, let's get going. I'm gonna. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad you kept the introduction short because you don't it need. Could go on forever. Well, not only that, but there's a lot of boring stuff it's in there. <laughs> but it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to talk about one of my new passions, which is. Uh, the state scenic rivers, particularly the Little Miami River. When Bob um, and I stepped down from uh, Columbus and he no longer was governor, it was like uh, being pushed out of a nest, and a little bird pushed out of the nest before you're ready to fly. But we um, flew and we landed here in Greene County in Bellbrook and we uh, found a wonderful home right on the Little Miami River. And I think often it takes fresh eyes to look at your, your locale and see what's special about it. Uh, I know when we've lived other places, it's only when out-of-town visitors came that we went to sightsee and see all the wonderful treasures that were in that locale. And so it's a sort of the same way with the Little Miami River. As uh, we lived there, I learned to read the river and I would see at certain times of the year, at the flood stage particularly, when a lot of trash would go down the river and got, got me very involved with how to protect the river. And this is sort of my journey, and hopefully your journey too, in learning the value and the importance of what we have right here at home. Uh, this year is an important year because it's the 50th anniversary of the Little Miami River becoming the state's first state scenic river and becoming the state's first uh, federal wild river. And it all started because of a man right here in Dayton named Glenn Thompson. Do any of you remember when he was editor of the journal Herald and what a big conservationist he was? He not only started the uh, Scenic Rivers Act in Ohio, he started what is now the Ohio Environmental Council. He started what is now the Little Miami uh, Conservancy. He started the Five Rivers Metro Parks. He's, he started the Dayton Beautiful Association. He just did a lot. And we are very, very thankful to him for having the foresight to think that um, natural areas should be preserved and, and stayed and um, saved. And so uh, 51 years ago, the state passed its first in the nation Scenic Rivers Act. Ohio, we can be proud of them for leading the nation. The nation's uh, Scenic River Act uh, um, happened about eight months later. So we really were the first. Uh, Glenn Thompson had his finger in both, and uh, we can thank him for um, a lot of the good things that have happened um, <coughs> since then. And if I can get this to work, yeah. Um, he was the, um, when we moved here and saw all the trash coming down the river, I realized that citizens can do something about this, and I was just an average citizen, so I got busy with my neighbors. And we started a group called the Little Miami Watershed, uh, Little Miami River Cleaners. And our goal was to have a cleanup once a year to take the trash out of the river. And we started in 2010, and by 2015 we realized that there was a lot of visible trash we were taking out. In fact, we had taken out about five, uh, five tons of trash, about 700 tires. Uh, but there was a lot of invisible things that, that were polluting the water that we couldn't see. And so we um, started a group called the Little Miami Watershed Network uh, with the help of a Dayton Foundation grant. And uh, through that organization, we are trying to um, network together all of the nonprofits that work to keep uh, rivers clean, the Little Miami River clean, and particularly the upper section of it. And that's our mission and vision statement, and you can see how we're a collaborative organization and are trying to raise everybody's voice so it can be heard. And one of the things that we want you to realize is that you live in a watershed. Doesn't matter where you live, you live in a watershed. And this is the watersheds of the United States. And that pretty purple part in the middle, that's the Mississippi River watershed. And you can see that it covers most of Ohio the little green part goes into Lake Erie, uh, into the Lake Erie watershed, 
but the Mississippi watershed is by far the largest watershed in the nation. And when there are floods up in the northern part of it, it affects the Gulf of Mexico, just like pollution in our part of the state um, winds its way into the Gulf of Mexico. And now in the Gulf, there is a dead area that's the size of Texas, all because of what you and I put down our drains and don't even think about, and that all the stuff that rolls off of our yards. Um, so if you look at Ohio and get a little closer to home, we have two basic watersheds. There's the Lake Erie watershed and the Ohio River watershed. And if you all are familiar with Summit County, it got that name because it's at the summit of the, of the sheds. If you dropped a um, water in one part of Summit County, it would go to Lake Erie. In the southern part, it would go to um, the Ohio River. And then if you look even closer to home, you'll see that we live in uh, two major watersheds, the Great Miami Watershed, which is blue, and the Little Miami River Watershed, which is sort of a yellow-green color. And you can see the difference. If you live on uh, Sawyer Road, if you live close to Town and Country Shopping Center, you're right at the, the summit of the tipping point of those two watersheds. East of there is the Little Miami, west of there is the Great Miami. So if that gives you any kind of a, a route um, 48, is it just about a pretty good dividing line between the, the Great and the Little Miami Rivers. Um, the first state scenic river law was passed by Ohio. Um, it was signed by Governor Rhodes. It was um, done in 1968, as you can see, and uh, we have a lot to be proud of in our area, all because of this man, Glenn Thompson. And he believed, as that quote says, that someday a corridor of green will stretch from one end of the river to the other, and individuals and families will enjoy peace and quiet and restoration of the spirit that comes with clean water, birds, and trees. And that's one of the goals of Little Miami Conservancy, uh, the Little Miami Watershed Network, is, and other groups, is to make sure uh, that there is green space along each side of the river. And why is that important? That's called the riparian way, and that is the ground with the trees and the grass that helps to purify the water, bef runoff water, before it gets to the river and helps slow it down so it doesn't erode banks as much as it, it would otherwise. The Little Miami River is important because it's the only river in the state that the full liver, river is a scenic river. Um, Ohio has um, 15 designated streams totaling 831 miles, and there's three different designations. Um, and one thing to remember is that even though it's a state law that protects the rivers, uh, private property is not impacted anyway. It only says that if public entities are going to do anything that will impact the river, then they have to get state permission to do that. In other words, if you wanted to put a new bridge, if you were the city of Dayton and you wanted to put a new bridge over the uh, Mad River or over the Little Miami River, then you would have to have special permission and get it, run it through a process. Here are the rivers, and you can see how short many of them are. That's because they're only sections of the rivers, they're not the whole river. But that longest one down there at the bottom is the Little Miami River. The southwest region of the state has um, three um, um, scenic rivers in it. We'd love more, so if you know any down in the, the southern part of that green area, please let us know. Um, they, the uh, green and the purple area are lacking in, in scenic rivers, so we need help in uh, finding people who are interested in saving their little part of the world. But you can see in the green area, we have the Little Miami River, we have the Stillwater River, and we have the Greenville Creek. Those are three rivers that um, Glenn Thompson and Marie All helped to make sure got on the scenic river li list. Um, the Little Miami River is 107 miles, the Stillwater is 58 miles, and the Greenville Creek is 35 miles. And so we have about 200 of the 831 mi miles of scenic rivers in the state, so we have a large part of it. Now we don't have the most rivers, the northeast section of the state has more river sections, but we have a large number of the miles because of the Little Miami River. I bet you all have seen these signs along the rivers. 
That means it's a special river and to look out for it. Some of the things that make it a special river is that it had a local interest, letters and resolutions of support, it had a designation study outlining why it met the criteria that are important. It had a public comment period, and then the Ohio Department of Natural Resources director made a journal entry, and then it became official. The last scenic river to become official was done in December 2019 when the Paimatumi Creek up in the northeastern Ohio uh, officially became a scenic river. And to become that, you have to have this study that talks about the outstanding water quality, how it has that filter strip along the sides, how it has few bridges, how it has high biological diversity, and, and how it has local support. In the Little Miami River, which we'll, we'll uh, talk about uh, the most, but also the still water in the Greenville Creek all meet these criteria through various ways. The outstanding water quality means that it's clear and clean and that the state tests it three times a year with a program they call stream monitoring, um, stream quality monitoring. And they count the macroinvertebrates, the little animals that live under the rocks on the bottom to see uh, how pure the water is because there's some that like really clean water and will not live in any other kind of water. And those are the ones that we look for and count the most because that helps us clarify the um, level of purity. It has to have continuous uh, filter strips or riparian uh, buffer uh, zones. And I didn't really realize how important that was until um, I started looking into it and people out in the western part of the county would say, oh, you need to go look at Greenville Creek because on the Ohio side of the river there's lots of riparian way and on the Indiana side there's nothing. And I didn't believe them so I took a drive up um, a State Line Road and this is what I saw and I bet you can tell me which side is Ohio and which side is Indiana. It was very easy to see once I got there. A little uh, limited human intrusion means bridges uh, and uh, there are not too many bridges on the, uh, on the rivers in this area. This is one in, on the Stillwater River, but I bet you all are familiar with this one. It's the big uh, Jeremiah Morrow Bridge over 71 um, over the Little Miami River. Uh, this bridge is kind of important because it points up a, a fact that if you stayed on that level all the way to the um, headwaters of the Little Miami River, they'd be right there. But you can see from this picture that the Little Miami River and the bike trail next to the river are 200 feet below. And if you took that bridge and took it down to Cincinnati and looked at the Little Miami River where it enters the Ohio River, it's another um, 200 feet below this bridge. So in all, it, it shows you how much the Little Miami River drops between its headwaters in Clark County and its mouth in, um, at the Ohio River. Um, it has high biological diversity. There are mussels, um, fish, and uh, larvae that uh, live in the river because it is a, such a high quality a stream. And that little Dobson fly larva is one of the best things that you can have in your creek in your river because it only lives in clean water. And if we don't find those, then we get worried. But when we find those in great numbers, uh, we get excited. So that means that the water is uh, swimmable, fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. And that's one of the things we like. Um, here is the Little Miami River sign that's right next to my house. And um, it's one that I clap about every time I go across that bridge to get home. Um, it was the first river in the state. It's the only one that has the full length designated. And it flows through five counties and drains 1,700 square miles. And it's within a 30 minute drive of three million people, which is something that most people do not recognize, that it has great potential as a tourist attraction to bring economic uh, vitality to the, uh, this part of the state. It's a national scenic river. 
It's one of only three in the state to have both state and national uh, certification. And to do that, you have to have these qualities. And in um, 1980, the lower part of the Little Miami River, which was the culmination of an effort to start at uh, Clifton Mill all the way down to make it a state, a national scenic river. And if you go to Clifton Mill and have pancakes, uh, go to 68, look at the bridge, and there is a sign that say it's the beginning of the national scenic river of the Little Miami River. So it's kind of exciting to do that. If you go to Clifton uh, Mill and you have those pancakes, you better walk in the gorge, too, <laughs> which is one of the uh, four uh, gorges on the Little Miami River, which again makes it very special. And how does the Little Miami meet National River standards? Well, it's scenic. If you've ever been on it, you know how pretty it is. A lot of that is thanks to Glenn Thompson, who worked really hard to make sure there were trees along uh, both the river sides. Um, and we are now finding that um, prairie grass is just as important. In fact, I learned through the Allwood Connection that uh, an acre of prairie grass can absorb nine inches of rain an hour and that it stores carbon underground. And so even when you burn the top or cut the top of the grass, the carbon is not released into the air. It stays hidden, buried underground. So if you have a stream, if you have a creek in your backyard, or if you are on a committee, on a community, impress upon them the value of, of keeping some green space, either in trees or in native prairie plants, along those streams and creeks in hollers to protect the, the water, slow down the flash flooding that we are seeing everywhere now, and to uh, clarify and clean the water. We know it's scenic. It's just the Little Miami River and the Greenville and the Stillwater are very scenic rivers. They're very pretty. They need all the protection they can get. There are many, many recreational opportunities, particularly along the Little Miami where you have the bike trail, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. But fishing and canoeing are very prevalent. Um, it is um, geologically uh, unique. Uh, we talked a little bit about the um, gorge, the Clifton Gorge. That level, that Cedarville Dolomite level, that's uh, the top level of Clifton Gorge, is the Dolomite that Niagara Falls water goes over. It goes all the way to Niagara Falls, which boggled my mind. I didn't know that. But it wasn't until the glaciers cut Niagara Falls that the prehistoric uh, Lake Warren uh, shrunk inside to become the current Lake Erie. And so uh, that's one reason why we have the um, Oak Openings area, because when it was Lake Warren, a river from Detroit called the Detroit River came in and brought a lot of acid sand. When the glaciers made Lake Erie smaller than Lake Warren, all that acid sand blew up and formed um, the sand dunes that are now known as um, the Oak Openings. So ge geology plays into this greatly. Uh, because of the glacier and the way it uh, dammed up the, the valley that, was, uh, that is the Little Miami River Valley, the Little Miami River has four gorges instead of the normal one. Most rivers have one gorge at the top, but the Little Miami has four as you go down the river. You have the Clifton Gorge, you have the Narrows, which is right in our backyard, you have Fort Ancient, and then you have Kings Mills down by the Cincinnati area. So it's all kind of interesting how it all ties together. Uh, it has a um, wide variety of fish and wildlife diversity. Some things are only found in this river, and uh, so we like to count them and make sure that they stay there. It's very historic. Uh, it, uh, the bike path was the first railroad um, in a valley. It was the path that uh, St. Clair took to defeat the Native Americans uh, in um, pioneer times. It um, at one time had a railroad up and down. It also had uh, f five mills in Clifton Gorge, but it had 300 mills up and down the Little Miami and its main tributaries. They all disappeared in the early um, 1800s because the water that they needed uh, to run became unstable. And the reason it became unpredictable and unstable is because we cut down all the trees in the watershed. And there was nothing to hold the water or let it 
uh, hold it back, let it slowly sleep, seep into the, the aquifer, and let it do what it needed to do, which was protect the, the water in the streams. It has great archaeological features. Are you all familiar with Fort Ancient, which was really a Hopewell site? Uh, it and two others, the ones at Chillicothe and the ones at Newark, are part of an effort uh, to become World Heritage Sites, uh, a site in Ohio, which will bring at least 30,000 visitors to the state in the first year. Uh, as predicted, and that should happen in 2021, maybe 2022 at the latest. Uh, so it'll bring a lot of um, important importance uh, internationally um, to uh, to this area. There are many, many people who want to have a checklist and check off every World Heritage Site in the world that they can go to visit. Just like there are many, many people who want to make sure they go to every um, national park in the United States. Well, the World Heritage Site effort was uh, started by President Nixon and copied after um, our national park um, process. So uh, we're hoping very much that we become uh, the, about the 25th site in the United States out of about, uh, about 1,200 sites worldwide that are part of the World Heritage Site uh, recognition. It has high biological diversity. Those little muscles on the, that you see here are telltale signs of the purity of the water. They are nature's purifier. They suck in all sorts of stuff and spit out everything that they don't want, which is all the pure water. <laughs> uh, um, at one time, there was a big mussel industry in Waynesville. They collected the, the pearls out of those mussels. Uh, there was also um, a pearl button industry in Ohio because the mussels were so big in the Little Miami River that they would stamp out pearl buttons. There is a uh, study underway now that will be a replica of a study done about 20 years ago uh, where uh, a PhD student at that time uh, went and did for his thesis. He counted all the different kind of mussels in the Little Miami watershed and where they were and how many there were. And now as a professor, he is redoing that to see if what has changed. And we predict that there'll be the same varieties of mussels, there'll be fewer of them, and that there probably will be an invasive species or two because of the way that ecology is moving. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. But basically, the Little Miami River Corridor is a success. It's 100 miles of exceptional warm water habitat, and that's why we have all those dobs and flies and those um, smallmouth bass and those other things that people like to um, fish for. Um, and it's an outstanding state um, resource for water. And over 52% of the borders of the Little Miami River are under some kind of protection, which is a pretty high number. We still would like to have the other 48%, but, <laughs> but you know, that may take another 50 years. <laughs> Um, and it is no longer the ninth most threatened river in the United States like it was in 2005. In 2005, most of the water treatment plants were not as strictly regulated as they are now, and the effluent that they were letting out into the river was not as clean as it is now. And fortunately, it's been cleaned up because this time of year, the water level is very low, and I suspect about 90% of the water in the Little Miami River, and in a lot of our rivers, are uh, effluent from the water treatment plants. So what do we have it to lose if something happens to the Little Miami River? Well, it's about a million people come and visit the uh, Little Miami Scenic Trail. Three million people live within uh, 30 minutes, and it's an economic asset uh, that draws tens of millions of dollars every year. You know, if you're a company and you hire a young person, they want to know about the recreational opportunities. And these are, uh, things that you can have in your community that don't require a big infrastructure cost from you. You don't have to have a water system. You don't have to have a big parking lot. You don't have to pay taxes on it. You, you know, you, it's, a, it's a green industry that we can really develop. And this is a picture of the Little Miami watershed. Everything in blue is the, water, is the Little Miami watershed. The green is the Great Miami watershed and you can see the bright blue river running through it. You can see all the orange and yellow. All that is hardscape. 
and that means it's impervious surface. That means if rain hits it, it's going to run off. And one of Glenn Thompson's biggest fears was that the, um, the Cincinnati area and the Dayton area would merge and be solid, um, solid hardscape. And you know, that's still our fear. <laughs> it's getting closer every year. And um, why is that important? Uh, it's been important because that means that there are a lot of oh, um, storm drains, there's a lot of parking lots, there's a lot of uh, runoff pollution that can go right um, from its source into the river without being filtered through land, uh, which is this natural cleaning agent. If you look at the population of this area, you can see how in the 1960s and 50s and 60s it began to level off. But if you look at our footprint, you can see through the uh, purple and the dark green that we have continued to enhance our footprint. So fewer people are making a bigger footprint uh, on the land, and that is detrimental to all of us because if we don't have the land to purify the water, to purify the air, to uh, support the pollinators who support the crops, you and I are going to have a hard time living. It's just that basic, and so we need to protect our natural areas as much as we can. There are major threats to the river. Uh, it's the only major uh, scenic river that has two major metropolitan areas at its top and its bottom, and they are merging quickly into one. Uh, it's already 20 to 30 percent hard surface in many places. If you look at Beaver Creek and Kettering uh, and some of the other communities, they're already all built out. There's very little green space in them. And uh, studies have shown that when uh, watersheds get to be 10% hard surface, that the water quality automatically begins to drop. And so with the upper reaches of the Little Miami, we have to work extra hard to make sure that what goes into the water is clean, uh, is as clean as it can be. And it's that first flush of rainwater after those storms that are most damaging. If you think of everything that's on a parking lot, uh, oil and gas and cigarette butts and anything else you can think of, that immediately is, rushed, uh, is cleaned off that parking lot with that first heavy rainstorm, goes into the storm drains. Those storm drains are like underground rivers without any way to slow it down because they're concrete, and they go immediately into our streams, into our rivers. And the rainfall in our area is increasing. And with climate, climate change, the predictions are that we will have more rain in the spring, less rain in the late summer when we need it for the crops, and it'll get hotter. So the chances of us having more uh, damage to our streams and rivers is greatly increased. Um, the loss of filter strips is one of the greatest threats to our river. The floodplain filling in, you know, people want to build on every available space there is, but when you fill in a floodplain, the water's got to go somewhere, uh, and the water is going to find that where, whether it's in your basement or not, it doesn't care. <laughs> so it, we need those natural spaces um, that um, are nature's way of, of providing safe spots for uh, high water to go and to um, slowly seek into the aquifer and uh, become a, an asset instead of a liability. Um, the more we increase the hard surface, uh, the means the less we have uh, going into the groundwater to uh, recharge it, the more we have going into stormwater uh, runoff, and the more sedimentation, the more gr dirt that goes into the water will continue to happen. And so some of the results on the Little Miami River are these. You can see the fallen trees in the river. You can see the exposed roots on the back bank. Those orange roots are roots of the um, Osage orange tree, uh, which is a very tough tree. Uh, it was brought to this part of the country from the west with Lew by Lewis and Clark, and it became the favored tree for farmers to use as fence rows because it never rotted. <laughs> and so when they fall in the river, they're not going to rot either and they're going to become the beginnings of uh, uh, log jams, such as this one that's at Trabine Road and, and old uh, Dayton Xenia Road. Uh, this one's just starting. There's one that's just south of 35 on the Little Miami River that's now three football fields long. 
and it's impossible to move it out. Uh, and we're working hard to prevent this one from growing, but it's all these flash floods that, that are now taking um, trees that fall off the banks because they don't have any bank underneath them to support them anymore, like the 200-year sycamore tree that fell off of our property, or the um, ashes that are all dying and are, have no place to go but down. Um, they all are causing these backups, and so we're really concerned about those because those log jams cause things like this. Uh, every time there's a high water um, flooding, lots of rain in a short period of time, what we now call rain bombs, we have uh, roads closed and parks under, underwater um, because uh, that water is looking for a place to go and it's going to go where it has to go. And we also see uh, things like this. This is down in Spring Valley, which is very green and pastoral and you would think would not have any sediment runoff. But you can see the brown water that is coming out of a ditch at Spring Valley into the green, greenish water of the Little Miami River after a flood. And so this is a hard, hard um, thing to see, but it tells us that, uh, wow, look at all this stuff that's along the river. And he, the uh, Pooh says, yeah, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> so, so we really need to all work together to kind of save it. And why is it important? Well, because we use it. You will see that uh, dark blue, 83% of the water in the Little Miami watershed, groundwater use is used by people, either for a recreational purpose or for drinking purposes. So we need to protect it, or we're not gonna have anyone fishing, or swimming, or drinking out of the Little Miami River, which are the three main things that it's used for. You can see that agriculture is uh, a lot less. It's only 5%, um, and uh, golf courses and industry and, and uh, miscellaneous things are are even more minuscule as, as a percentage. But we love the river because it's, it's our future. Uh, and I hope that you will take your children and grandchildren out to the creek, out to the river, get them involved with nature, uh, because if they don't love it, they're not gonna protect it. And it's gonna need help for the next 50 years. And it's an economic asset. It increases property values, tourism, and an employee recruitment and retention. Uh, we're working with uh, Ohio State University to do an economic asset study of the Little Miami River Corridor, and hopefully that report will come out in a, uh, a year <laughs> uh, so that we will have some real numbers to be able to give to you. But we owe it to our children. If we degrade the environment too much now, they're not going to have anything to purify their air or to purify their water or to give them um, rest and relaxation and peace of mind. They are now just having uh, research done on the health effects of being outside in, the, in a wild space or in a park space, in green space, and how it's very important to our mental health as well as our physical health to have these green spaces. So you all can help in a lot of ways. You can tell your local government that it's important to you, that you can help them upgrade the zoning codes, update the land use plans, all of our communities have to go through this process every five to 10 years. And so check with your community to see if it's your time and if you can get involved and if you can bring resources that will help them protect their waters um, in their process because a lot can be done on um, land use and in zoning codes. And if all of our communities get together, then the developers can't play one community off against the other which they like to do a lot. Um, and so we need to get you involved to talk to your elected officials to make sure that uh, your community is protected. And we have a lot of uh, partner organizations that work with us. If you don't see your partner organization up there, please let us know. We'd like to have, you have them join us in our efforts. And uh, we would like for you to uh, practice and to encourage best practices for building sites, for individual building sites. There's a program that you all probably know called LEADS, which is a construction site um, effort to get voluntary to get businesses and builders to uh, collect points so that they can become a gold standard or platinum standard uh, building uh, based on these quali qualifications. Well, there's now also an effort called SITES, S-I-T-E-S, 
that goes along with that that promotes uh, green building techniques in the um, landscape uh, part of the process so that you use materials that are close at hand, that you use more native plants, that you think about uh, invasive plants and not put those in, that you do all sorts of things that can help uh, the environment uh, stay in uh, good shape. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that um, things that are built are socially, environmentally, and economically sound and acceptable. And, and that's where you get real sustainability because everything will be in balance. Now the Little Mammy Watershed Network has a couple of programs that we um, promote to help remind people that what they do in their yard is important to the Little Miami River, but also to the Mississippi River and the Ohio River and the Gulf of Mexico. And one of those is to put um, medallions on storm drains that remind you that only water goes down the drain, only rain goes down the drain. We don't want leaves, we don't want um, trash from the curb, we don't want uh, grass clippings from your yard, because all of that builds up, stops um, and dies, and as it is carried down to the river, it's that um, extra nutrients, that's dead uh, green matter that forms the algae blooms. And it's the algae blooms from the runoff of the farms up in the Lake Erie area that is causing such damage to the Toledo water supply. Now, just because we live downstream, don't get the idea that we don't have algae blooms, because we do. Uh, Lake uh, Caesar Creek is fighting some right now. Uh, uh, East Fork Lake has some. Cowan Lake has a few. Um, if you don't have running water and you have a lot of nutrients, a lot of um, phosphorus and uh, uh, nitrogen flowing into the water, you're probably gonna get excess growth and when that growth dies, it uses up the oxygen and it, be, uh, and it makes a dead spot. It makes a place where no fish or animal, no aquatic life can live because everybody, including us, needs oxygen. So we hope that you will join us and uh, help us put uh, medallions down in your neighborhood. Uh, we hope that you'll help us erect signs that alert people to where the watershed is and what watershed they live in. And it would be fun if you and your uh, children and grandchildren would join us for a cleanup. We have one every June. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, you probably see some familiar people there on the edge closest to the water. Uh, this is a, one of the tire halls we took out a couple of years ago at Glen Thompson Park uh, launch. Uh, and that's a lot. And we're having another uh, cleanup this fall, particularly focused on tires. Um, and um, I suspect we'll get another good haul um, because the water's low now and we can see them all. Whereas in the spring, the water's usually too high to see too many of them. But it's a great time. You can see we get all sorts of trash out of there. One year, in one section, we could have built a car because uh, we, found, we found all the parts to it. <laughs> Um, but we celebrate with the River Festival afterwards so that we can um, compliment and thank all of our wonderful volunteers. And we get over 300 volunteers to come out in June. And then on September the 7th, we're having a Trailblazer Adventure, which is our chief fundraiser. So please organize a team or two to help us. Uh, it's very family friendly. We're going to start at Heisley Park in Warren County and hike the trails in the park. A ride on the bike path that's there and a canoe down the river a little bit so that people can can get points for stopping at information um, booths to learn a little bit about the corridor and and how important it is um, to us and so we need uh, help uh, from you all to make sure that the next 50 years brings the results that we want that it is a place that sustains life in uh, plentiful water, and that it, we all can stay healthy as, the, as a result. Uh, because it's what we're leaving our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that's really the most important thing that we have. And so we need to think about it. We need to all do our part, and we need to work now to make sure that their future is as bright as ours was. So I want to thank you for helping. Uh, keep the Little Miami River clean and healthy. There's some handouts over there. There's one that looks like this. 
and it tells you about where you can call if you see something you don't like happening in your property or in your neighborhood. And then 10 things you can do on your own property to help keep the water clean. And then there is a sheet over there like this. And we're asking you to please give us some information on where we can take this message to another group. Uh, I know people here have heard it three or four times, and I think that's great. I hope it's a little bit different. I hope you're remembering something you, you'd forgotten. Uh, because um, we need to educate a lot of people um, about um, about the importance of our water. And then there's an envelope if you want to get us help on getting some of those medallions down. They're about $5 a piece. Um, we'd love some help in that regard. And we'd also love some help uh, on our September 7th um, Trailblazer adventure. If we have a few more times, uh, minutes, I'd be happy to answer some questions. It is. It is. You said the start was in Cedarville and not Cedarville. Well, Listen, yeah. yeah. What about? Oh, the part above that? Yeah. Um, it is basically um, not navigable. It's just a lot of little streams that are going coming together to joining. There's uh, The Little Miami has two major creek uh, <coughs> spokes to it, and they don't join together to form one river until they're at Cedarville. I mean, at, at Clifton Mill, yeah. So that's kind of the beginning of, of a one branch, the main branch, what they call the main branch of the river. And you mentioned the Mad River, but it hasn't been any part of your discussion. Is there, what about the Mad River? The Mad River is not designated yet. There is a group of citizens that are working very hard to make it a recreational river, which is kind of the lowest level of the scenic river statuses. Um, but they, um, and they've had a study done which, which outlines the wonderful characteristics of the river. Uh, they're having a little trouble with um, getting the local support, getting some of the major groups on board to write the letters to, um, to the Department of Natural Resources. So if you have any contacts there, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> okay, well, it's a beautiful river. It's, um, Cool. It's, um, it's spring fed, so it, it's cooler than a lot of the other rivers around. Uh, yeah, when, uh, when uh, Anna, our daughter, was young, we used to take an overnight canoe trip on rivers with another family, and we always liked to do the Mad River in August because it was cool. <laughs> with the Little Miami River, that time of year doesn't have much water in it, but the Mad always had water and it was always cool. Did you have a, a question about beforehand about the still water? The new prairie. The new prairie. Uh, many of you all have heard about the issue that Allwood Audubon uh, Center and Farm and Allwood Metro Center and Garden and uh, uh, Inglewood Metro Parks are having because there is an effort by the city of Dayton to build right on top of the prairie called the New Prairie, which is the headwaters of the Wiles Creek. Now, Wiles Creek is about a mile, uh, less than a mile and a half long. And it flows through these three green areas into the Stillwater River. And once it gets to the Stillwater River, it joins with the Stillwater River, turns the corner, and right there are the water uh, well fields for the city of Inglewood. And they supply about 13 to 15,000 people with their water that comes through their tap. Now, if you look at the beginning of Wiles Creek, it flows out. Uh, it doesn't even flow out of a drainage ditch that is, so it's supposed to from the prairie. The prairie roots are so deep, it takes the water way down into the aquifer and then it bubbles up in about um, 10 to 15 wet spots in all wood. And because that water is crystal clear and cold, it, it provides very unique habitats for the plants and animals in Allwood and in Allwood Gardens and in Inglewood Metro Parks. Now, if you build a manufacturing center on top of the prairie, it will eliminate all that prairie glass. It will change the ability of the land to absorb the water, which it does now about nine inches of rain 
per acre per hour. It will f create flooding because all of that water will have to go into a detention pond that will go through this little pipe that will cause flooding in all these green spaces. It will change the water temperature from being 55 degrees to being over 80 degrees. So it will ruin the habitat for all of the wildlife that is in these areas. It will cause erosion. It's already, um, the Wiles Creek, the building that's going up by the airport right now is already changing um, the flow patterns and causing erosion after rain bombs. Uh, uh, Allwood Gardens had major repair bills uh, to some of the uh, legacy, the hardscapes that, uh, that Marie All has put into that garden. Um, it will just, it will become a parking lot. They think, the rumor is that it will become a battery manufacturer. Uh, so you think about all the things that go into making batteries, and do you want those in Wiles Creek, which goes into uh, the water supply for Inglewood? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Um, Allwood now, uh, Allwood Ottoman Farm, because it is so close to the airport, it has to have a, a, a massive water treatment system on site and have its water tested every day so that it can give it to people that visit. So if uh, this plant becomes reality, its wells and all the wells of the people that live around the area that are not on the Inglewood system will be negatively impacted. And it has a good chance of uh, ruining the green spaces of Inglewood, of Metro Park, of the Allwood centers, uh, so that they are no longer valuable as green space. And so that would open them up to potential development too. So if you don't, know, if you haven't signed up uh, and you have uh, feeling for this like I do um, and you hadn't signed up on the petition uh, please go to the Allwood site to change.org and sign up uh, because they need uh, to show a lot of people are in support of saving this area not of kiboshing buildings in industrial use and um, jobs but there are a lot of other areas in the Dayton region that are in the city of Dayton that would be maybe better spots than to ruin this wonderful ecosystem that is providing so much service free of charge <laughs> to the community. So if you would sign up, if you'd go to uh, city, uh, Dayton City Council meetings, speak up, raise your hand, talk to your friends and neighbors, <coughs> uh, anything that you can do uh, put it on your Facebook, whatever you do, uh, it would be very helpful because we need to keep the um, momentum going uh, and to help the, the city realize they have other spots for building and that people really want this spot preserved as a prairie for the economic asset that it is that the city wants to eliminate. Does that about answer your question? Why does anybody want it? I mean, well, that is not for me to say. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, it. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's uh, there are estimates that that a building could bring from sixty to two hundred and six uh, to two thousand and sixty jobs, but but nobody knows for sure. Uh, it's all very. Um, uh, it's all a lack of transparency. On, on a lot of levels, so a lot of it is just rumor. We don't, we don't really know. All we know is that um, there is an effort to pave over this prairie. So they already own the land? The city already owns it? Yeah. I didn't realize that. Any questions? <coughs> mm -hmm. How did you get rid of the tires? You the we are very fortunate in the Greene County uh, 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 environmental services area will take them for us free of charge but there are groups um, one of the tire companies will take them back I, I've forgotten which one but we've because we haven't had to deal, deal with it but there is uh, at least one weekend a year that when Montgomery County and Greene County will have free disposal for tires so uh, there are ways to do it 
uh, uh, entire recycle or uh, law would be great, you know, where you would get a deposit back if you turned in a tire to a, a facility instead of turning it into the river. <laughs> that would be really great, but we're not there yet. So we have to look for partners like the Green County Environmental Council. I didn't realize it was tradition to throw your tires in the river. Why well, it, it must be for some people because <laughs> we found everything from white wall tires to tractor tires to, to bicycle tires in the river. So, Why would you think that would be a member? I don't know. It's, you know, a lot of it is, is just uh, litter. Why do we think, that, why do some people throw their cans out the window? You know, so it's just, uh, uh, it's just a lot of things go into keeping our environment healthy so that we can stay healthy. And that's what it's all about. If there are not any more questions. I have one personal question. Uh -huh. I have a bunch of old shampoo. I mean, then I have a, you know, half a bottle left. Just to dump that down the drain bottom. What do you do with stuff like that? Um, you might want to give it to a nonprofit that works with um, homeless populations. Well, they wouldn't want this. It's just been, you know, it just needs to go out. Uh huh. Well, please, and, and one thing I like to talk about that I forgot to this time is please don't put your medicine down the toilet. Because that goes into the water system. Most water systems, purification systems, can't take it out. Um, and as I say, you know, fish don't really need antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure they don't need um, um, shampoo. shampoo either. But shampoo well, would be shampoo would be a lot less <laughs> than some things. But you know, uh, places like Greene County Environmental Services, and I'm sure uh, Montgomery County have special days when you can turn in things that. You, that you don't know what to do with, like paint. So find one of those days and take your shampoo and put it all in one container and take it down there that day. Yeah. If it hasn't been opened, I know of lots of places that you can take it. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, in fact, uh, the Tandana Foundation, which our daughter started and does health care down in Ecuador, uh, collects those little bottles of shampoo and soaps that you like you get at the hotels to take down there for our programs there. But if it's opened, it's, you know. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much for letting me come. I've certainly enjoyed this. And I hope I get to see some of you someplace else that you will <laughs> spread the word and help. <laughs> Thank you.